one day, 10 years ago, if you came to Harpers Ferry, you could see me out in the green and I would start to say, welcome to the Harpers Ferry National Historical Park. My name is David Larson. I'm a park ranger here. I'm holding in my hand a tool. It's about a 1841 Harpers Ferry percussion rifle. Uh, it's a very, very, very important weapon in our country's history. It's made, of course, of dead wood and made out of cold metal. Uh, it loads by the muzzle. A soldier would actually be issued 40 cartridges, 40 little bags of black powder with a bullet sitting on the end of them. And the soldier would, would actually empty the black powder, the gunpowder, into the end of the muzzle, into the barrel, would then put the bullet on top, would ram the whole thing down, whoops, okay, seat the bullet, and he then would have to, to prime the weapon. He'd have to get the spark or the ignition that would allow the weapon to go off. This is a percussion weapon. It has a, a cone or a nipple sitting here at the lock of the gun. The lock, the lock really is the ignition system. It's the machine that makes it all go off. There's the cone or the nipple on the, on the gun. And in the end of the cone, there's a, there's a hole that goes into the barrel. It's called the vent hole. And it connects the inside of the barrel to the outside of the barrel. A soldier would take a little brass cap, shaped just like Abraham Lincoln's top hat. And then at the top of that little tiny cap would be a bead of explosive called fulminated mercury. Just like a, like a kid's cap gun, it's a, it's a, it's a um, solution or a substance that when you strike it, when you cause percussion on it, it will explode. And of course, with this weapon, when the hammer came down and hit the fulminated mercury, that explosion would travel through that vent hole I told you about, would catch the gunpowder inside the barrel on fire, would cause a, a second explosion to occur and send the bullet out flying. This is also a rifle, which means there's grooves cut into the inside of the barrel that turn as they go down to the bottom. And that allowed for great accuracy. Previous to, to rifles, we had, had muskets, which were smooth barrel guns. Uh, and a musket, that, that had a musket with a smooth barrel, well, the ball would sit in it kind of loose. And when you fired the gun, the ball would bang around the inside of the barrel, and depending on where it bounced last, that's kind of what direction it would take. Very, very inaccurate compared to a rifle. A rifle, however, in order for those grooves to bite into the bullet, of course, it had to be tight, which is a bit of a problem for a soldier, because you had to force that bullet from up here at the top all the way down to the bottom. That took time. But this is one of the weapons that first saw the invention of the Civil War mini ball. Instead of a round bullet, a Frenchman from, uh, a Frenchman from France, hello, <laughs> came up with a conically shaped bullet that had the bottom third hollowed out. And it was made smaller than the diameter of the, of the bore of the gun. So it would slide down nice and easy. But when that explosion occurred in the bottom of the gun, it would drive up into that hollowed out part of the bullet, expand those sled skirts, made it bigger, and of course then it would be grabbed by that rifle and those grooves and come out with a spiral and a twist. Just like a football thrown the right way, it became a much more accurate weapon. So that's this tool. That's this machine. You load it up the right way and you fire it at the right time and it does what you want it to do. But I believe this is more than that. I like to think about the hands. Hands with calluses on them that might have made this weapon. You see, in the 1840s, this weapon is the very symbol of modern times. This tool in the 1840s means dramatically different things to different people who worked here in Harpers Ferry. I live in a building, I live in a home uh, that uh, was built in 1847. It was built by a guy who worked down the bed factory. And sometimes at night I think about the conversations that might have taken place in my living room. I imagine this man having his father-in-law living with him. Of course, you know, that sets up some certain tension within the family, right? You know, this guy's living there with his father-in-law. guy's probably got kids and, of course, a wife. And I imagine this guy is, is working in the United States gun factory. And indeed, he did. I know that for a fact. I think about this conversation between the father-in-law and the son-in-law. And sometimes I see the father-in-law saying, son, you know, you've lost your freedom. You see, son, I'm a craftsman. And when I worked in the United States gun factory down there at the rivers down where, where, where you know, the heart of heart, heart Ferry is, um, I controlled my own destiny. I spent seven or eight years of my life working as, a, as an apprentice learning how to be a craftsman. And if I didn't like the way they treated me, well, you know, I am my own tools. And I can pick up and I can move down the river and I can set up my own gun shop someplace else. 
I control my own destiny. I am what 1776 is all about. I'm what liberty and freedom means. And I see that son-in-law looking at his old father-in-law, just shaking his head, saying, Dad, you just don't get it. I'm making more money than you ever dreamed of making. I'm making it without all of that training. I'm making it without all of that time. And father-in-law argues back and says, but son, you will never own the machines it takes to put out a weapon now. Because all you do is stand around kicking pedals and moving raw materials in and out of those machines. If the men who own those machines decide they don't want you around anymore, you're lost. You have lost what 1776 is. And the son says, but dad, you can never afford to send me to school. You could only afford to buy us the things that we had to have to stay alive with. Look at my house. Look. It's full of knickknacks and toys and things. I can send my kids to school. I own books. I own newspapers. Our lives are better now, Dad. Did you see it, sir? <laughs> of course, one day the old man will die, and, and eventually the son-in-law will die. <coughs> Their perspectives specific to them may be lost. They're still there if we choose to remember them. They're still there if we choose to think about them. That's probably a good reason to have a park. I'm going to load and fire this quickly. And as I do, you may want to cover your ears because indeed it will make a loud noise. But right after I fire, I want you to take your hands off your ears. I want you to listen to the sound that makes it come off of the mountain. Listen to the echo. Um, There's an old echo. The son-in-laws heard this echo many, many times in the 1840s and the 1850s. And the craftsmen father-in-laws heard it well before then. It's an old sound. It's the sound that you get to hear now. You have the same opportunity that they had, the opportunity to ask yourselves what this tool might mean to you. Ready? Aim. Fire, bang. <laughs> <laughs>